Never before have we been faced with so many choices about how we should think, act, and live. How should we spend our time, our resources, and our money? Blessed are the pure in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How do we view ourselves and those around us? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How can we find true success and lasting happiness? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. How can we know what is right and true? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How can we make sense of suffering and loss? Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And those of us who want to continue with Jesus need to choose him and choose each other in a deeper way. Welcome to the choices we face. Hi, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. My name is Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck, our co-host, is with us again. And our special guest today is Father Dan Jones, who's a seminary professor at the same seminary that I work at, a Sacred Heart Seminary in the Archdiocese of Detroit. And Father Dan's had a, a lot of contact with Mother Teresa and her nuns, and we're gonna hear about his work and insights into her, her life and ministry. But first, Father Dan, would you just uh, tell us a little about your own story? You know, how, how, how sure. you ended up becoming a priest and sure. doing what you're doing? Well, I, I was raised a Catholic uh, and uh, I really believed the, the faith. Uh, but when the turbulent uh, 60s came, I, I began to be sort of distant from the Lord, distant from the, the church. And I remember senior year of high school, I met a group of folks uh, uh, a group of students who were meeting, it, what surprised me, they were meeting voluntarily. Uh, <laughs> they were having a little prayer meeting, reading the Bible, and uh, I heard about what they were doing, and uh, what, what struck me is they were doing this out of their own desire, not for any other reason. So I asked if I could go. I went, and uh, on the one hand, the meeting was just very simple, wouldn't, not so striking, you know. But I realized, um, in the course of the meeting, and as I, as, as I went home, I remember kneeling down in my room as a senior in high school and saying either Christianity is true or it's not, you know. And, uh, and if Christianity is really true, um, it has to mean everything uh, for a person. Uh, it's the most significant thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. It's, uh, it's God stepping into human history. And I said, I had, I had to make a decision. Did I really think it was true or not? If it wasn't true, then, then I would leave it. If it were true, um, Everything had to change, and I remember saying to myself, "You know, you were at a Catholic high school at this time." I was at a Catholic you? high school, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I remember saying to myself, yeah. um, "You know, I think it's true. I think it's true." And uh, in a certain sense, I felt like I, I, I really just, I have no option. I have to. My life really has to change. And on that level, um, you could say at first the level of truth and conviction about the faith. I, I said, "Yes, this is true." And. And so I began to, to look for ways to dedicate my life to the Lord. Shortly after that, I, I came in contact with Charismatic Renewal. And uh, what happened through that, I'd say, was somehow what was in my mind, in my head, was able to percolate down to my heart. And I was able to uh, come to experience what I already believed, deeply believed, and was already beginning to, uh, to live by. So meeting Jesus personally really... Uh, it profoundly changed me. Um, I remember my friends noting the fact at the time that everything in my life seemed to be changing, what was going on, you know. But it was about that time, just a few months later, I was, uh, I was praying in a chapel. I still remember the place, the time. This was in the 1970, uh, 1971. Um, when I was desiring to give myself more completely to the Lord, uh, I remember saying as I was praying, God, I'd, I'd, I'd love to live a life where, in which everything was given to you. I'd love to be a priest. I'd love to live a, a life of poverty, of, of mission, an evangelistic life. And I, I said to myself, but I probably couldn't. <laughs> you know, I said, I, you know, I've got a girlfriend. I, I probably need to be married. I, boy, that'd be great. But I, I, I don't know if I could do that. You know. You mean you don't know if you'd have the strength to do it, or what do you mean yeah. by that? Yeah, at the mean? time I yeah. said, I don't know if I would have the strength to do it, the, the ability to do it, you know, mm -hmm. the love to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, of, one of the few times in my life I've, I've, I could say I really experienced God saying something clearly to me. 
then was, uh, I felt like the Lord said, you know, he, he gave me faith such that he said, you know, if, if this is something you want to do, if you want to give yourself to me in this way, I'm not going to withhold from you the grace to do it. Um, I'll give you the grace to do it. And uh, that simple conviction just gave me faith that I could, I could live this life. And I remember walking out of the room, in fact, and, and talking to, to someone you, you, you know, Patty Mansfield. Uh, oh my goodness, Patty Mansfield. She was, she was leading this group. And, <laughs> and uh, I said to her, Patty, you know, I, I decided to be a priest. And of course, I'm 17. And she says, well, that's, that's good, you know, <laughs> not knowing what's, what's going to come from a 17-year-old, you know. Yeah. But this is at the, as I said, in the, in the early 70s, the times were very turbulent uh, in the church. The times were very turbulent in our local seminary, the one in which I now teach. And uh, I said, you know, I don't, think, uh, I don't think this is what I probably ought to do right now, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, one thing led to another, but I, 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 I uh, ended up going to the University of Michigan, being involved in the, in the lay community that was beginning there. And uh, after that, through that, uh, through the life of the community, uh, became part of a brotherhood, uh, a religious brotherhood that had, uh, began at that time. A number of us in the brotherhood had the desire to be priests and the understanding that as we were trying to, uh, trying to initiate this life, that that would hopefully be possible eventually. Mm -hmm. To make a long story short, it, it, it proved not to be. Um, that is to say, uh, the brothers at the time uh, thought perhaps it would be, but in the evolution decided that it really should remain a lay group. So at that point, a number of us who had wanted to be priests uh, were, you know, were able to leave uh, uh, very, very amicably and, and uh, with, with a lot of support uh, to become priests. So it was only uh, in 1992 that I ended up uh, mm. actually, uh, so pretty recently, you know, uh, going to seminary. It's a long wait and period of formation. A long wait, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, yeah. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, I, what, I, what I always said is I, I tried to follow the best light that I had at sure. the time, you know, as, mm -hmm. as Newman uh, used to say, and uh, it just was much, much longer than I, uh, than I, that I would have anticipated. But, uh, but in any case, um, you know, in the course of those years, as for all of us, I think we, you set out trying to live a life only for God. Mother Teresa used to say, only all for Jesus. Uh, I tried to live really only all for Jesus. Yes. But you know how when you try to do that, it, your sure. fervor waxes and wanes, you know. Mm -hmm. you, uh, and I remember starting with, with tremendous ambition and desire and uh, desire for generosity, generous love, you know. What, when you entered the seminary? When, when, I, when, I, when I first, first made this decision start off to, to make the decision yeah. to yeah. follow the Lord, you know. But, uh, but in the course of the years, I, 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 I learned a lot about myself, uh, learned a lot about others, and, and I'd say uh, I had a much more sober assessment of what I could do, of what maybe I thought was possible. Um, and I remember setting off to, you know, to, uh, uh, to go to Rome. I, I studied in Rome uh, for the priesthood, and uh, I was sent by Detroit, and thinking, God, I, 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 I've had great ideas in my past. I, I, let me just do a little bit of good. Let me do some good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, it, again, to make a long story short, through, through the course of formation there, uh, I was eventually ordained. And just after ordination, I was asked to, uh, to stay on to do further studies in Rome. And, uh, and it was in that, that time, just after my ordination, that I met the sisters, Mother Teresa. Um, I remember coming to San Gregorio, uh, a church there on the Chalian Hill where uh, St. Gregory the Great first sent off St. Augustine to, uh, to evangelize the Angles mm. in, in mm. England. He said, go turn the Angles into angels. Um, but it was on this hill, but it's, it's that hill where, the, where his church is, and uh, in a little chapel by the side is where the sisters live, uh, a little, uh, little unit with a chapel. And uh, as, I, as I was offering Mass for them, I just remember being sort of overwhelmed by, uh, by encountering my first love in their life, you know. Seeing in them what you had yeah. once given yourself to and mm -hmm. being renewed by it. I, uh, what I realized is that these women had, had known and seen and lived with a saint. And they really had the, the aspiration and the expectation that they were going to do that. That's what they were going to do. 
I remember as a priest, what was very moving for me was is I raised the Eucharist. Um, boom, they all go down. They, they all prostrated themselves on the floor. Uh, it just struck me what reverence, you know, they had mm -hmm. for the Eucharist. They had a tremendous reverence for the priesthood. And, uh, and I think I, in a certain sense, I, I learned a lot about what it means to be a priest from them. Mm. I probably learned more from them about what it means to be a priest than I learned in seminary, mm. actually. Mm. I'll just give you one little example. Uh, there's one of the sisters, uh, Sister Gertrude, is the, she is the second sister to join Mother Teresa, you know, so back in, she was one of her students, high school students, and uh, in 1947, as she, as she begins things, she joins. So she's been, she's been through a tremendous amount. She's opened foundations all over the world, and Ethiopia during the famine times, and uh, she's, done, uh, she's done a tremendous amount. At the end of Mass one time, uh, as I'm in Rome celebrating Mass for them, I'm taking my vestments off and she comes up to me and she says, she's pretty intense Bengali, very old now and wise, but she says, do you know what you do? I said, well, what's Sister Gertrude going to say to me? <laughs> she says, do you know what you do? You do more in one Mass than I've done in my entire life. Do you know what you do? Hmm. You know? <laughs> in a certain sense, I say, no, I don't know what I do. I, I, I don't appreciate enough what I do, but their life um, has had that kind of an effect. Isn't that me, wonderful? You know? yeah. Father Dan, we're just going to take a little break now. We'll be right back. We want to hear more about what you've learned from your contact with Mother Teresa's nuns. All right. The decision to have an abortion not only affects that moment in your life. Kristen Gordon. It affects many precious moments to come. I now pronounce you man and wife. Please remember, where there's life, there's hope. A message from Priests for Life. Welcome back. We're talking with Father Dan Jones from Sacred Heart Seminary in the Archdiocese of Detroit, which incidentally is a very good seminary, yeah. <laughs> and with Peter Herbeck, our, our co-host. And uh, Father Dan has just been telling us about his journey to becoming a priest and how when he was in Rome, he came into contact with Mother Teresa's sisters there and how it really helped him to even understand more what the Lord was calling him to as a priest. And where did it go from there, Father Dan? Well, I... Uh I made, some, some priests would say I made the mistake, but I, I, I gave my card to one of the sisters one time. Uh, San Gregorio and said, you know, if you need anything, let me know. Well, <laughs> sure enough, not long after that, uh, it, being a student in Rome, you know, you, you don't go back home all the time. So uh, this is at Christmas time. One of the sisters said, uh, oh, Father Dan, she's Irish, you know. What, what, what would you be doing for Christmas? I said, I don't know, sister, what am I doing for Christmas? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, how'd you like to go down to Sicily and give some talks? I said, well, good, you know. Yeah, but that kind of got me into, uh, with my free time, you know, vacations, things like that, to, uh, to give me retreats for them. And uh, I, always, I always thought that at the time that uh, I benefited more than they did <laughs> uh, from the time with them, but they managed to get something out of me as well. And uh, through that, I, I just, over the years, uh, the last number of years, had a lot of contact with them, uh, with their work pretty much all over the world, you know, Africa and Asia. And like you mean you travel to Africa and Asia and done yeah, retreats for them? Yeah, retreats for them. See, they, they, uh, Have the, you ever the, been the to language, I, yeah, about six times. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah I was just, just there this past <clears> year, uh, teaching a, a course for their formators. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, now, when you came into contact with them, Mother Teresa had just died. She had just died. So you've never died. met her personally, no, never, but you've had a chance to, to really meet her through her sisters. I felt like I really know her. Yeah. I feel like I know her, but I know her through the sisters. Yeah. What, what, sure. what would you pick out as something from her life, her spirituality, the way Jesus was present in her that could be helpful to people? Yeah. Really, you know, there, there, was a, there were two sides to Mother Teresa. You know, there, there was the external uh, life, you could say, that people could see, giving talks, the work, uh, the work with the poor. One of the things that people didn't see so much, surprisingly, till after she died, was what was on the inside, what was going on the inside with her. Uh, she did an incredible job, you could say, 
concealing certain things that were going on the inside because, uh, as she put it in some of her letters to her spiritual directors, I didn't want to attract attention to myself. I wanted, I wanted all the, the attention to be on Jesus. And if they see these things, they'll, they'll perhaps pay more attention to me, and I don't want that. She said, I, I want to be like Mary, who, who kept all these things within her heart, you know. But uh, I had the a privilege of working on the, the cause for canonization uh, for, for Mother because I was still in Rome there and just helping out a, a bit. Um, and, uh, and what was very striking was as letters that she had sent to her spiritual directors at the time um, were made available uh, to the cause, her own sisters were very, very surprised by, by this inner life that she had. If, if you wanted to sum up sort of what what was going on in this inner life, uh, if, you, if you go into any of the chapels of the Missionaries of Charity, you see a big crucifix on the back wall, and then just uh, to, to your left, as you're looking at the crucifix under one of the arms of the cross, you see the words, I thirst. Um, these are words from the Gospel of John, John 19, that Jesus says just before he dies. It seems that Mother uh, Teresa had, very early on in her life, uh, a deep, deep, you could say, appreciation, insight into that thirst of Jesus uh, for, for all people. Uh, she had been living a, a very you know, fervent religious life as a, as a Loretto nun, very, very generous. One of the things that came out in the, in the cause of canonization, these letters, that, is that uh, back in 1942, as a Loretto sister, she'd made a vow, a private vow, to refuse Jesus nothing. Uh, and uh, it was just part of the expression of love. You know, Hans Ruth von Balthasar says that love always takes the form of a vow. It, 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 it leads us to make promises, you know. And so she, she made that private promise. She didn't tell anybody about it except her spiritual director and then uh, directors afterwards. But then in 1946, as she goes off on retreat, she begins to hear something from Jesus and he asks her to begin this work. Um, she, she meets the, the request of Jesus with a, with a great deal of fear. It involved uh, going out in the streets of Calcutta, you know, and it, it, the fearful prospect for someone who, who's living uh, you know, a relatively sheltered life in a convent. And um, as she meets with fear, Jesus responds to her, you've been saying all this time you want to you want to give me everything, and now here I'm asking, will you refuse me? Will you refuse me? And, uh, and in a series of, of uh, encounters with the Lord, uh, the Lord convinces her to, to, to leave uh, the comfort of her, uh, of her convent and, and begin a new congregation. But as I said, it has something to do with an insight into the thirst of Jesus. Um, Easiest way to perhaps understand it is to look at, at John 19, what's happening in that passage. Uh, these are the, the final words of Jesus, as it were. You know, St. John says, uh, when all was now finished, Jesus said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. He's quoting uh, Psalm 69. And uh, Psalm 69, the, the section that he's quoting from, says, I, uh, I, I look for pity and there was none. For, for consolers, and I found none. Uh, in my hunger, they gave me poison. In my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Jesus is thirsting. And what St. John's trying to tell us is that uh, Jesus is thirsting for more than just water. He's thirsting for, for our souls. He's thirsting for our love. Mother Teresa's insight, and, and really what she had then was a revelation from, from Christ, was an insight into the way that Jesus, even still, in his risen, glorified, ascended life, not only on the cross, but even now, continues to thirst. He continues to long for, for our faith, for our love. And the thing that's especially remarkable for Mother uh, Teresa was that she was able to see Jesus' presence thirsting in every human being, thirsting particularly in the poor. She's able to see in a personal way something like what, what we see bring, uh, coming out in the scriptures with St. Paul, for example, as he's on the road to Damascus persecuting the Christians. A voice speaks to him from heaven, and he says, uh, who, who are you, Lord? The Lord says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Mm -hmm. So also, why do you persecute me? 
I, I'm present in them. You're not simply persecuting my body, you're persecuting me. In the same way as Jesus on the cross is saying, I thirst, she realized somehow that Jesus continues to thirst. But he continues even now, through his presence in the suffering members of the body, still in some mysterious, very mysterious, hard to understand way, continues to suffer with those who suffer. And the whole purpose then, the whole aim of the society she founded was, as she expressed it, to satiate the thirst of Jesus in the poorest of the poor, to satiate his thirst for love and for souls. So in their early life in the convents, they, uh, on the crucifix, along with I thirst, on the lower right, they would also put I satiate. Mm. Um, how do I respond to this, this thirsting Jesus, Jesus thirsting in the poor? I satiate his thirst. How do I satiate his thirst? With love for souls. I give him now the consolation that he was looking for and never found. When on the cross uh, we gave him vinegar to drink, what I want to do now is to give him my love. You know? And uh, I think the sisters, what was surprising for the sisters is Mother would talk about this, but she would never go into great depth or great detail until uh, I, they, they never learned the depth of this insight until after she died and these letters mm. came forth, you know, from her spiritual directors, or to her spiritual directors. Um, and, 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 and since then, since her death, there's been an amazing sort of release of the power of this charism in the society. It's been remarkable. Uh, the, degree to, the, the, the degree of spiritual power the sisters have been able to, to come to, and I think to others who come in contact with them, of this, this idea of the thirst of Jesus and it, its power to, to motivate us to love and to heroic love in the way that it motivated her. Mm. In some of the letters that got released, uh, Father Dan, there was, it talked about, you know, as the Lord was drawing her from the Loretto, from the sisters, into this new vocation, she was, there was like an ongoing dialogue, there was even some spiritual consolations, she mm -hmm. was getting, you know, insights, and then once she, if I have it right, once she said yes and picked up that first child in the street or whatever, something changed very differently yeah, in that right. relationship. And yeah. she walked in the dark night of the soul or dark night of the senses, literally, I guess, the rest of her life, if I understand it right. And what's yeah. that all about? What's going on there in relationship to this thirst? That's a good question. It was one of the, one of the questions in the cause that, that, uh, that those working on the cause, the postulator was trying to figure out. She had tremendous consolation right up until 1946. As soon as she said yes, stopped and 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 she had darkness for for 50 years you know uh, one of the things they're trying to figure out in in the in the cause was uh, is this a kind of a darkness of purification for example you know uh, some spiritual writers uh, as spiritual doctors will talk about the fact that darkness can pr produce a purification in the soul mm -hmm. um, Another, another read on it, though, and, and I think this is really what, what Father Brian thinks was going on, if, if I have him right, is uh, that there was, there was a, a gift that the Lord gave her of union with his own thirst and suffering in the poor. Hmm. And that somehow in saying yes, she was saying, she was saying yes in a way that embraced his own thirsting in the poor so that she began to experience it in herself. Hmm. Hmm and uh, began to experience, you could say, the desolation, the darkness that the poor experience and that therefore Jesus is still experiencing in the poor. Um, one of the things that marks this darkness is longing. She continues to use this word, longing. She talks about feeling distant, very separate from the Lord. And, and that's one of the things that's so surprising to her sisters to, to, to hear her speaking about, they're writing about this. But she says, but, but nonetheless, the longing is, is painfully intense. Mm -hmm. She writes at times that, uh, that in her longing, her heart, her will has never, been, never separated from him. But there's no experience of him. Mm. Um, and the longing then is perhaps, I think, a mirror of Jesus' own longing for us. You know, mm. it's this intense, intense longing for, for Jesus through a sort of a, a separation of darkness, uh, a will that's fixed only on him, that mirrors his will 
fixed only on us through the darkness of our sin and often mm -hmm. our separation from him, our suffering, mm -hmm. w w which he himself is longing to, to draw us through and call us through. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought Father Contula Mesa had some interesting insights that's, that's right. probably related yep. to this where yep. he said that also it could have been a protection the Lord was giving her from the huge publicity she was going to get in the world, yep. the way the world was going to laud honors on her and this was a way of keeping her, knowing her own need in a certain kind of way yep. as well as also identifying with the need of the poor that she was serving, you know. She said to one of her sisters once, uh, she said, or she writes actually, she says, uh, all these honors, all these things that, that everybody would love, you know, she says, but the one thing I want, I can't have, and that's union with Jesus, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Good. Yeah, it makes me think of something that the God the Father said to Catherine of Siena one time. The Father said, uh, Catherine, you, you'll never be able to love me as I love you because I love you completely gratuitously. You know, and there's always going to be an element of, of gratitude, of response, you know, of when you love me, you're, you're responding to my love, first of all, in creating you and then redeeming you. But he said, you know, you can love your neighbor gratuitously. Yeah. You yeah. can absolutely freely choose to love somebody else, even if they don't love you back, even if they don't appreciate it, even if they don't want that love. And when you love your neighbor like that, I'm going to count that as loving me. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the mystery of, of the love of God, mm -hmm. and the love of neighbor that, that you were talking about. Father Dan, we're going to have to stop now. But thank you so much for being with us. Thank you You're so welcome. much thank for saying know. yes to the Lord. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. And thank you so much for helping form the priest of the future at Sacred Heart thank Seminary. You, yeah. Thank you, Peter, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've written a booklet called What Happens When I Die? And we'd like to give it to you at no cost just for the asking to help you in your own relationship with the Lord. Call the 800 number, or write to the address, or access the website, and we'll be able to send it to you right away. Until next week, this is Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck and Father Dan Jones wishing you the very best, a life surrendered to Jesus, a life trusting in Jesus, a life that says, Jesus, I hold nothing back from you. Life is short, and the years fly by with increasing speed. Life is fragile, and the fate of all human flesh is death. At some point, we all ask, what happens when I die? Is there life after death? What will it be like? How does what I do in this life affect what happens when I die? My booklet provides some answers to these important questions by reflecting on what Scripture and the Church say about what happens when I die. To receive this free booklet, call Renewal Ministries at 1-800-282-4789 or visit us on the web at renewalministries.net.